Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. Hey everyone, before today's episode gets started, I just want to talk a little bit about the fight against Alzheimer's. For those of you that don't know, my family has been impacted by Alzheimer's and my wife and I are members of the Young Champions for the Minnesota North Dakota chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. The world may look a little different right now, but one thing hasn't changed. The Alzheimer's Association's commitment to ending Alzheimer's. This year, Walk 10 Alzheimer's is everywhere on every sidewalk, track, and trail. Due to COVID, this year won't be a large in-person gathering. Instead, everyone will be walking in small teams of friends and family. We are all still walking and fundraising for the same thing, a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia. So I'm asking that if you can, please support our team for the Alzheimer's Association's Walk to End Alzheimer's. This walk is the world's largest event to raise awareness and funds for Alzheimer's care, support, and research. Thank you in advance, and you can find information and links below. And now, back to the show. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Commander's Core Studio. Welcome to the show. So, Zendikar Rising spoiler season has finally wrapped up, and we've all had time to check out all the cards on the list and see what our favorites might be, what ones might have an impact on Commander, which ones might we add to our decks. And so at first I thought, hey, I'm going to do an episode where I talk about all my favorite cards in this set, but then I had a better idea. I talk a bit too much, and so I need some help this time. You know, this time I'm going to have some other content creators, some other fellow friends of mine, talk about their favorite cards as well. So you're not just, you know, listening to me drawn on about, you know, whatever random cards I decide from this set. I'll still say one of them, but we'll get to some other voices first. Hi, I'm Daniel from Quest for the Jank Lord. The card I'm most excited about in all of Zendikar is Mirog, Fury of Akum. Because magic's greatest victories are not won in the combat step. They are won in the second, third, and fourth combat step. And this Minotaur friend is going to give you all of those for the very low price of one landfall trigger, which is amazing. Unfortunately, green decks are probably going to be the ones that abuse this the most, but there are a lot of mono red and boros decks that I think are very happy right now. Also, have you seen the alternate art? It is vicious and beautiful. Also, how do you say a comb? Is it a comb? A comb? Please tell me. Zagris, Thief of Heartbeats. What is not to love about this card? He's got a dope name, he's got super sick art, and he does some nutty, powerful things. Uh, on top of that, he's a vampire. When I first started Magic in original Zendikar, uh, my two favorite decks were allies and vampires, so already he's starting off on a great foot. On top of that, he gives all your creatures death touch. Super cool, what's better than that? Oh, death touch versus planeswalkers. What? I love it, it's so great. Um, on top of that, he discounts himself uh, with the coolest new mechanic, which is party, which I love because it's a crossover of another one of my favorite things, Dungeons and Dragons. So this guy is ticking all the boxes for me. Absolutely love him. The one thing he's probably missing though is the color blue. Hi, I'm Joe with Quest for the Jank Lord. And one of my new favorite cards from Zendikar Rising is Yasharn Implacable Earth. One of the reasons I love it so much is it's so utilitous for Commander. It works great as a Commander because it pays for its own tax every time it has to go back. It might take a turn off if it's uh, put back into the Command Zone, but at least when it comes back in, it goes and it fetches you two more lands that you can add to your pool, which really ramps you up. I like that, and it's not unbalanced. It's fair. You get two basics. It's that easy. And the other thing that I really like about this is the second text that it has at the bottom there. Players can't pay life or sacrifice non-land permanents to cast spells or activate abilities. I really like that. It shuts down all shenanigans on the table. So no more cricks going off on you. No more uh, of the uh, Aetherflux Reservoirs holding you hostage. I just think it's a really fair card. It balances out the table. It's not broken. And it's really evenly costed. 4-4-4-4. Four, 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 four. That's a good cost for a good body. I really like this card. I think you'll have a lot of fun with it in Commander. Hi everyone. Hi Mitch. Thank you guys so much for asking me. Well, thank you Mitch so much for asking me to be a part of this Zendikar Rising collaboration. So the card that I'm looking most forward to from this release is 
Draina, the last blood chief, uh, for three and two black. She is a legendary creature vampire cleric with flying. Whenever Draina, the last blood chief, attacks, defending player chooses a non-legendary creature card in your graveyard. You return that card to the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it. The creature is a vampire in addition to its other types. Now, as you guys know from my previous collaboration with Mitch, I love tribal. I love vampire tribal. So having a card that fits so well into your vampire 9-9 that allows you to bring back creatures, give them plus one, plus one counters, and make them vampires. So if you have anything that triggers when vampires enter the battlefield, like if you have Edgar Markov or you have any sort of like, uh, triggers that give you points for having vampires, you get to boost it up. You get to put extra counters on it if you have a card that pluses up all your vampires. So just a really great tribal card. Additionally, if you're doing some kind of aristocrat deck, it's just a great way to get cards back out so you can keep sacrificing them, keep bringing them back, keep making there be more value, and it also, if you want to attack your opponent, it makes them not want to block you. So either way, it's a win-win. You can be aggro, you can be strategic, you can be political about it. It's great. So I love that. I love all its uses and the art is amazing. Like this is gonna be a great cosplay card for people. And um, it's just a bunch of fun. And it gives me everything I want. Pretty girls in art, being vampires, flying, and being super powerful. So this is definitely gonna be a card that I know is gonna fit very well into one of my established commander decks. So can't wait. And it's already sold out on Card Kingdom, so. It's doing something right. Hey, it's Olivia Gobert Hicks. And even though Princess got to take Drana for me, because I was most excited for Drana, um, I actually really think that Charix, the legendary Leviathan Crab, is a pretty fun card. Um, the ability, while it takes kind of a bit of mana to make it work, would be great in like Simic, so you could play it with Rixmithies. Uh, it would be fun in Secret or Tribal, anything that you can switch power and toughness and get some, you know, counters on it and then just swing in with an absolutely humongous crab butt <laughs> is pretty sweet. Um, I think there's going to be some interesting ways to utilize it. I don't know if it's necessarily going to be like a commander for me, but I think there's a lot of cool ways to make it work in the 99, um, have some tricksy abilities, just Voltron, a giant crab. And now we have a legendary crab, so... We can do Crab Tribal. It may not be great, but we can do Crab Tribal. So that's pretty awesome. Hello, Eddie checking in here. You might recognize me from Close Quarters or a couple podcast episodes. Uh, I'm here to talk about some of my favorite cards from Zendikar Rising. The first of which is a card that I can uh, imagine fitting in so many decks. It is called Balaged Recovery. Uh, it's a modal dual-faced card, so it can be a tapped green source, or it can be a sorcery for two and a green. Uh, it says return target card from your graveyard to hand. Those are uh, some words that you might remember from Eternal Witness, a uh, commander staple in over 70,000 decks, or Regrowth, uh, which does the same thing. Uh, so for this reason, you can get Balagate Recovery, three mana, Exact same wording as Eternal Witness, with upside, just like Eternal Witness has upside in creature-focused decks or blink decks. Um, plus, I think this one is going to be pretty budget for all you budget players out there. So give it a shot, see what you think, and uh, let me know. Hey everyone, I am Joseph from Casually Competitive MTG, and the card that we are most looking forward to from this upcoming Zendikar Rising set is one that, if you're familiar with our games and playstyle, is not going to be too much of a surprise. The card is Archon of Emeria. This card is an absolute house. It's a 3-mana 2-3 flyer that not only forces everyone to play Magic the Gathering in a fair way by limiting everyone to one spell per turn, but it also has an incredibly relevant asymmetrical stacks effect that remains relevant throughout the entire game, hurting cards like Fetchlands and really any deck that runs more than 2 or 3 colors. This card is going to see a lot of play in a lot of higher powered or competitive matches and we're really excited for this card's release. What's up, Spikes? Jim here coming at you from the beautiful Spike Feeders World Headquarters here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Mitch called me up recently and he said, Jim, what commander are you most excited to build in Zendikar Rising? And this is a question that I get a lot, but I'm going to level with you here. I don't really get excited about building new commanders as they're released. Usually what I'm doing is I'm looking in a set and finding cards that I want to play with, and then that usually inspires me to build something old. 
So rather than picking a commander to tell you about today, I'm talking about Leyline Tyrant. This card is a 4-mana 4-4 with flying, and if that wasn't good enough, because we need upside to 4-mana 4-4 flyers, it's got two relevant abilities that are linked to each other. First one is you don't lose unspent red mana as steps and phases end, which is so cool because we get to play with Braid of Fire. Uh, the second one is when Leyline Tyrant dies, you can pay any amount of red mana, and when you do, it deals that much damage to any target. I'm just enamored with this card. It's probably not like the best card you've ever seen, but it is a really cool one. And I love it when creatures have abilities that really play off of each other. Prior to this card, I think my favorite creature in all of Magic, uh, at least my favorite red creature, was Prophetic Flame Speaker. Same thing, the double strike and being able to impulse draw. Uh, this, I think, is probably my favorite red creature in the game right now. So it's really inspiring me to go back and look for older commanders that might uh, synergize with it. So uh, I'm looking at this, I'm thinking I want to build Mono Red Neheb. That's probably the next deck that I'm going to build. Either way, Zendikar Rising seems like a really cool set, and Leyline Tyrant right at the top of my list. Hey everyone, Ryan from Playing With Power here. Just wanted to say that our favorite card for Zendikar Rising is Thieving Skydiver. The ability to be able to essentially steal an artifact from somebody is really, really powerful. And in competitive EDH as well as regular EDH, you're never really going to see a game that isn't going to have something like a Soul Ring. Um, in, in the higher end of the spectrum, things like a Chrome Mox or a Mox Diamond or a Mana Crypt, and to be able to take this from somebody and gain that additional advantage is really, really, really a good ability. So that's our pick, and thanks a lot. All right, so when it comes to my favorite card from Zenikar Rising, there were actually quite a few that I was picking between, and Finally, I settled on one, and it might not be one that you expect, and that card is Spare Supplies. Spare Supplies is an artifact that costs two, enters the battlefield tapped, and when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card, and you can pay two and tap and sacrifice it to draw a card. Now, I picked this card probably because I have a soft spot in my heart when it comes to artifacts that can trip and cost two, most likely from the time that I built my Joyra deck, and I was looking to get my hands on pretty much every single one that I could. So this card might not seem like much to some, and it's pretty much guaranteed to always be budget, but it's an absolute all-star in the decks that can use it. So an Artifact Storm deck like Joyra, or a Brago deck that blinks things, or even an Eggs deck like Brea can really utilize a card like this, even though, again, it might not seem like a lot. It draws you a card on entering and on sacrificing, so it can provide you a lot of value throughout the game if you can use it correctly. Recently, Wizards has made more and more of these types of cards like Golden Egg, Guild Globe, and Sleeper Dart, and I'm happy to see them continue the trend. So if you've got a deck that revolves around artifacts, don't sleep on spare supplies. And with that, this show is coming to a close, so first off, a big thanks to everyone who shared their favorite card in this episode. I could not have made this episode without you, obviously because then it would just be me prattling on about my favorite cards, and yeah, no one will see that. Anyways, make sure that you comment below and let me know what your favorite card is from the set. What card are you most excited about? What one might you add to some of your commander decks? So yeah, let me know in the comments below, and as always, thanks again, and have a good one. <laughs>